Good evening and welcome to Buffalo Ridge Baptist Church. It's good to see you. Let's go ahead and stand, grab our hymn books, and turn to 142. We're going to sing Because He Lives. God sent His Son. much for singing. You may be seated. We're looking forward to a great time in the Lord's house, and we're going to pray together. But uh, before we do that, we're going to go over some prayer requests and let you keep up to date on a few things. You've got your prayer list there. I'll mention um, some of them on there, and then some others that possibly aren't, but we'll certainly go over these if you open that up. We're praying this evening for those that are still recovering after some procedures and surgeries and different things. We're praying for Stephanie Stedman, and she was here Sunday, but been in the hospital for a good while. And we praise the Lord for her strengthening. Please keep her lift up in prayer. Praying for Becca Foran over here, and uh, she uh, was here Sunday, but then here again tonight. So please pray the Lord will just continue to strengthen her and bless her recovery. And then Margie Hales over at NHC, we want to ask the Lord's blessings on her as she's there for rehab. And then praying for Pam Norris, had that hip replacement but we're praying that she's home and praying that the Lord would just bless her recovery. And then Timmy Akano, and uh, he had uh, surgery as well. And so we certainly, he's having a little bit of a rough time. Please keep him lifted up in prayer. Praying for Jeff Wills as he got sent home from the hospital yesterday. Just pray that uh, the medication that they've got him on would uh, bless in his heart conditions that he's, those heart issues that he's facing. And they did not do 
any open heart or did not do put a stint in, they're hoping medication can remedy the situation. So play, pray for him. And then uh, continue to pray for Brother Mitch Perry as well. He's over at Quillen for rehab after his release from the hospital. So please keep uh, praying for these folks. And then praying for those in the cancer list there. You see Pat Scalf, Debbie Deacons, Leslie Farmer, Judy Whitson, Karen Cole. And we're praying for Miss Sharon. Continue to pray for her. Pray for Sergio. Pray for Tracy, Kirk, and Lynn Anderson, Miss Edith and uh, Brother Bob, and then pray for James Ketron as well, and we want to lift all these names up to the Lord in prayer, and then we're praying as well for Joel Johnson, as he would have had um, dialysis today. Pray for Jan Saylor, I talked to her the other day, and she's getting along pretty well. Please keep her lift up in prayer. Pat Shaw, and Lola and Edgar Gamble, just different health concerns going on there. Pray the Lord would strengthen them. Sherry Edens and Sheila Daniels, and Jerry and Marcia Scalf, just uh, talked to Marcia, she was in just uh, yesterday, and uh, keep Jerry lifted up in prayer, if you would, please. And then Margaret Wood, and uh, she had had some test results, got, or tests got back, but they, they were thinking they had to do something about some of those compression fractures in her back, but it looks like they don't need to. That's from some old injuries, and so that's a blessing. Please keep her lifted up in prayer, though. And then Brother James McEwen, he's got some procedures over at uh, Vanderbilt, the extension there in Lebanon, I believe it is, so keep him lift up in prayer. They went over tonight. That procedure will be tomorrow. And then Miss Leslie Farmer praying for PET scan coming up on the 23rd. And then uh, Billy Snodgrass over at Johnson City Medical Center. And uh, his daughter, Tammy, said that they'd got hospice called in as well. So please keep him lifted up in prayer. And Brother Bob Smith over at Holston Valley. Jeannie Wampler up at Bristol. And so we've got a lot of folks to pray for. And we just certainly want to keep them lifted up in prayer. Praying for Estelle McRae and Ellen Krause over at Abundant Living. And uh, then Cecil Ball as well. Well, and uh, we want you to lift up these names in prayer if you would. Praying for our country, praying for some leadership here in the area, our district attorney and our county commissioner. And then on the right side, you'll notice that we're praying for uh, different missionaries, praying for Henry Bennick. He was here just not long ago. Keep him lifted up in prayer. The Heatons, our missionaries over in the UK. And uh, you remember last fall, I was able to go see them as well when we went over to see the Mullinses. And they're doing a tremendous job. So I wish everybody could have been over there. This old church that uh, was uh, just in the heyday would have been, had been uh, a bustling church, but just dwindled down to near nothing, and uh, then pretty much nothing, but they uh, got it deeded over to them, and it just reopened it as a Bible-believing church, and so just keep on praying for the Heatons up in Carlisle in the UK, and then praying for the Talbots in British Columbia, and we've got many folks to pray for. I want you to remember this Sunday night is that commissioning service from Miss Summer Scroggs, and we're looking forward to it. Please keep her lifted up in prayer. The Lord would uh, bring in more finances as uh, he knows what all she's going to need on the trip over, and then, of course, the ministry ministry over there and praying for Maddie Brown as well as she is into deputation towards South Africa and we certainly want to lift her up in prayer and then the Abbots are up in Quebec and uh, we, we want to pray that the Lord would uh, just strengthen them and be a blessing to the people up there as they allow some missionaries to go back and take a little furlough and take care of some issues and so don't forget to pray for the teens as well and many of you have been giving, or many of you have been the chug and chew down here to uh, help in that way. There's a, a fundraiser down there at Gray Station Hardware as you come into the deli part. To, uh, and so if you, if you want to come by, that'll help out the young people. Uh, others have just decided to give and help them out. I believe it'd be a worthy cause. And uh, so we challenge you to help out these young people as they go. Kyle, this Sunday night, will give a report about where the young people are as far as what it's taken. I believe it's about $2,200 per kid. Most of that's airfare. And uh, the others are food and things, but I think 1,800 of that is airfare just to get them over there and back. <laughs> Amazing. The parents of teens want them to come back. So it could have cost them $900 cheaper, but uh, they said, no, we want all of our kids back. And so please um, we'll, we'll pray for them, but uh, we'll give a report on Sunday night, let you know where they're at, and maybe the Lord move on your heart. And there's some, also some uh, chaperones that are going, and uh, maybe you'd like to help with those things. And so uh, whatever the Lord leads you to on that way. On the uh, fly leaf, as you turn in, uh, turn it over, I should say, the ministries we're looking at to pray for the, uh, uh, the middle school boys. Please keep them lifted up in prayer. And then praying for the ladies' ministry, my wife, and also Leslie Farmer. And then praying for Miss Stephanie Krause. Does a tremendous job in the office, and we thank God for her. And then praying for our Deacon of the Week, Brother Larry, and his wife, Linda. And then praying for bus number nine. Would you please lift them up in prayer, the Edwards? as the Lord continues to use them to reach people. I love our bus ministry. I think about the 
mission field that we have right here, and I want you to pray that God would raise up workers to uh, go out and visit in these areas. You say, Pastor, it's harder to get people to come. Well, God didn't, he didn't tell us to go when it was easy. He told us to go. And so I uh, pray that the Lord would raise up workers, that we could go out and knock on these doors and get folks excited about coming. And so please pray for the bus ministry. Pray for Brother Brent Scroggs over here and Matthew Hayes as they continue to serve the Lord and our nation. And we're thankful for all of that. Those are some of the requests that are on there. Let me make sure I don't have one on this sheet that we didn't get on the other. Uh, Miss Judy Whitson had some test results come back this week. Keep her lips up in prayer. Lord will just continue to show himself strong in her life. And uh, we're praying for Sharon Harmon as well. And maybe I mentioned that on the other list. And then Praying for Brother Bill Magnus, still uh, not up to 100%, but uh, keep him lifted up in prayer, if you would, please. And so those are just some that we wanted to make you aware of. Maybe you've got an unspoken. You like to say, I'm, I've got something heavy on my heart. I've got something I want you to pray about. I do as your pastor, and so I'm going to lift my hand, but maybe you've got something as well. Lord knows those things. You say, what good is that? Well, uh, I, I believe that we can just pray, Lord, those are heavy on the hearts of people. And I believe we have a prayer answering God. And so we're just going to pray and ask Him to meet these needs. And uh, then we're just going to have the organ play softly through. And uh, as she plays, I want you to just pray. you got your family here, pray together. Pray for the young people downstairs. I believe Braden's preaching to the teenagers, our intern. He's been down there for the last couple of weeks preaching to them, and uh, this week, he's been in there for the last couple, I should say, but preaching this week, so pray for him, pray for the uh, patch, the pirate, the young people over there in their services, and then pray that the Lord will meet with us, but let's take these requests to the Lord, okay? Would you play for us? Now, Lord, again, we just bring these requests to you. I pray for all those hands that signified something on our hearts. I pray that you would meet the needs of each one of those requests that were signified, dear Lord. And then I pray for these names that we've mentioned. I pray that you would just do a great work. We've got a long cancer list, dear Lord, and so we need you to touch the lives of them. We ask you for healing. But, Lord, sometimes that's not your will. I pray that you give grace and strength. And, uh, Lord, just please meet in a special way. We'll certainly thank you for all that you do. And, uh, Lord, bless the rest of our service. Bless the teens downstairs. Bless the kids over with Patch the Pirate Clubs and their lesson as it comes forth. And just a little bit, bless Brother Jordan as he'll preach to them, dear Lord. And uh, have a good time in the Lord. What an exciting place to be over there with the kids. And thank you for Braden downstairs. Lord, lift him up and use him in a special way. And, Lord, I pray that you bless the Bible study in this room as well. And we'll certainly thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you're able to stand together with us, Brother Stephen's going to come and lead us in 447. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. I'm pressing on the upward way.
for that. We're going to ask God's blessings on the offering. We also want you to pray for Brother Rich Goulrup. He'll be having a, a procedure tomorrow about 8 o'clock. And uh, so we're praying that uh, that will go well in his heart. And so we'll uh, ask the Lord's blessings on that as well. I forgot to mention that earlier. Father, we do pray, Brother Rich, that uh, everything will go well tomorrow. You just paved the way. And, uh, Lord, we just thank you for your goodness in that. Now, Lord, we come to this time of the offering. I pray that you take it and use it for your glory. Lord, I'm still amazed at how you uh, brought finances in for even the, uh, the um, revival, dear Lord. We were able to be a great blessing to the evangelists. We were able to be a blessing to the singing family. That's their, uh, Lord, their sole income, the Epleys. And they were so appreciative of the money that came in. And we sent it on through check. And uh, thank you, thank you, Lord, for taking such good care of us, but then also allowing us to be a blessing to people as they come and they minister. Thank you again for the chance to give. Bless in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. glad that we have can trust in someone who has planned every single detail of our life. Number 237, my father planned it all. What though the way be lonely and dark the shadows fall, I know where So much for that. As we look into the Bible in Colossians, we'll continue on, although it doesn't feel like we're continuing on because it's been so long since we've been in this setting and in Colossians. And so I'll remind you that for a month, Amy and I were over in the in the chapel on child rearing, child raising, parenting, and then different men of the church were in here, and then we had a service or Sunday or Wednesday rather before the revival. I want to have just an emphasis on prayer, and then of course the revival. So it's been uh, six weeks ago or so I, that we were in Colossians, but we're going to pick up right where we left off. And I'm looking at Colossians chapter three, verse twenty-two. And if you've got a handout on the way in, then you can use that along the way if you choose to. But we're looking at this, and this is that, about that work-life directives, meaning how we work and how we live and how we behave ourselves. And so there's a discussion going on right now and uh, indicating that God was somehow okay with slavery. 
Now, usually this is people that uh, want to critique or want to criticize, rather, the Bible and tear it apart and deny it anyways. And they'll look at pl- passages and they'll say, well, God's condoning slavery. Well, to that, I would say that look at the end of verse number 25. We're going to get there in just a little bit, but just as we get started, in case you ever had some wonderings about this, and there is no respect of persons. And so God has never condoned one person, an atrocity of one person treating another person like a a property or a possession. And that's a huge blight and a huge black eye on our nation. And I'm not taking up for anything that we've done, nor am I taking up for the founding fathers that were engaged in that. But I will tell you that out of all the nations in the world, we're one of them that stopped that. It took us longer than it should have, yes. And there's many things in our past that we did not do right but I remind you that the Lord hasn't ever come to a place where says, oh, well, that's fine. Just take your role and live it. Because you understand that the Bible also says how you're supposed to behave when you're defrauded. It tells how you're supposed to behave when you're lied about. It tells how you're supposed to behave when people do you wrong. Does that mean that God has somehow now said that, okay, I want people to lie about you. I want people to defraud you. Or I want people to treat you bad. No, but... God also knows our tendencies, and so He does give us the equipped Scripture, the Scripture scripture rather, to equip us to live in a broken world. So, just in case that that discussion is going on, but usually I find it, or I hear it, when it's people that are trying to uh, take pot shots at the Word of God, say, oh, God's for this and He's for that. Never has been. You look at, uh, you you look at, um, Onesimus, Philemon, the book of Philemon, how Paul was wanting that person who had been treated like that to be released and let go. So just a little side note. So we're looking at Colossians chapter 3, verse 22. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye servants, service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive the wrong for which he hath done. And there is no respect of persons. You'll slip down to the next chapter, but it really fits up with the, that, book, the, that, that chapter. There was, the chapter divisions aren't inspired necessarily, it's just that this is the way that the uh, translators put it down. Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal knowing that you also have a master uh, in heaven. So I want to look at this thing. In this section, we see how to handle ourselves, whether you're the supervisor in today's culture, in our world, if you're the supervisor or you're the subordinate, if you're the employee or the employer. And in other times when people truly did engage in that lifestyle that wasn't right, that uh, they, they owned and had servants of people, but the same thing would be true if you uh, come into a servant position. We're all supposed to be servants. But in this way, we see the directives given to you and I, how we're supposed to behave. And I trust the Lord will help us. I'm going to stop a little bit early because we've got a video that I'd like to show from one of our missionaries that they've asked us to, um, to not live stream it. So we'll get started here and then we'll stop in just a little bit and show a good video. Lord, bless us now is our prayer. I ask you to give us your touch this evening and I pray as the word gets into us, Lord, that you would change us through it. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus name. Amen. So there needs to be this heavenly look in our secular jobs. Somehow, sometimes people have this thought, well, you, pointing at me, you have a heavenly job. Well, that's true. I am trying to work for heaven's sake. I'm trying to tell people about the Lord. But you, if you, even if you don't do what I do, you have a, a heavenly aspect to your job as well because all of us can labor, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. We understand that we have this heavenly aspect, this secular job, but a heavenly look. And so we're looking at the upward look of our work. Where is it that we're supposed to be landing as we look into our jobs that God has given us? Well, we know that he tells us here how we're supposed to live, how we're supposed to behave, how we're supposed to be employed. So we see that we're supposed to fear God in verse number 22. Obey, your, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart. Why? Fearing 
God. So I can serve God, I can fear God by the way that I work. You can work here at Buffalo Ridge, or you can work at Eastman, or you can work at uh, uh, some government agency, or you can work somewhere uh, down in Johnson City, or you can work in Bristol, you can do all these things. But you and I, my friends, we may not be alike in what job we have, but you, we, you and I are alike in that we can please God in what we do. If I'm a teacher, if I'm an administrator, if I'm an employer, whatever I am, I ought to fear God. God. You say, why is that important? Well, there are employees. If you've got people under you, there are employees that are counting on you to be a God-fearing employer. And then not only that, if you're not an employee, you're an, or an employer, you're an employee, then there are employers that are counting on you to be a God-fearing employee. Because if I'm employing people, I want God-fearing people so that I don't have to wonder about whether they're going to steal from the petty cash box. I want God-fearing employees so that they're going to work for what we pay them for. But on the other hand, I want to be a God-fearing employer so that if we have somebody working for me, I realize that even though God might have put me in a different level of management than you, I still look at you as somebody just as equal as I am. So, let's get into it. The upward look of our work, we ought to fear God. Dad told us again and again, he beat it into us boys, that we don't take money for work that we didn't do. If you're going to work for somebody, you work for them. So it's all right. If you don't want to work for them, that's fine, but don't take their money and not work. You work, and uh, we've had all three of us, we've had lots of different jobs. We've all worked at McDonald's and We've all uh, mowed grass. My brother and I, we were the caretakers for a cemetery. Mow around all those. We've done different jobs. We've put up hay. We've done some construction work. Uh, the, mo the worst job I ever had was my one of my family members. They were big cigarette smokers. And so all out in front of their house, they had all these cigarette butts. And so I was a kid. said, we didn't want money. I said, I always want money. So a penny a cigarette butt. Say, oh, isn't that gross? Well, I was a kid. I didn't think about that time. I wasn't smoking them. I was just cleaning up after the rest of those smokers. So I think I got 400 I got $4. So, um, but whatever job you do, you and I are supposed to be doing it for the glory of God. We're supposed to be doing it fearing the Lord. And so we see this, this upward look. And there's a reason why we're having this upward look. Because if you look in verse number 23, we see that how we're supposed to be doing whatever your job is. Doesn't matter who's at the top of your paycheck stub or your direct deposit slip, whatever it is. You're supposed to be doing whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord. She so said, I don't like that boss man. We're not working for him. Well, you are. God uh, d d d differentiates them. But you're not working for him. We're as unto the Lord. So the Bible says, and then it goes on in verse number 24, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. And so we understand that this upward look, the reason it matters if I'm on the employee side of things is because I'm supposed to fear God. And even if I don't like that uh, old cuss of a person that's my supervisor, I'm still supposed to respond and react in the correct, correct way because I'm not serving him. I'm serving past him to the Lord Jesus Christ, much as it is in the way of our missionaries. Our missionaries are not going to the foreign field because they had such a love for these people. They do. But that's not the extent of it. Because they're going to find when they get over that foreign field, those people are pretty annoying just like the people here are. They're doing that. They're going to those foreign fields because they're loving past those people and they're loving the Lord. So I'm seeing this as we have this upward look. We're supposed to be fearing God as to the Lord. And then, if we're that employer, you say, boy, that guy's a rascal of a cuss of a person. God will take care of that. Look down at verse number 25. But he that doeth wrong, this is on both sides. But he that doeth wrong, which he uh, will re shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons, just in case you think one person is higher than another. And masters, verse number one of four, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. So the reason I put it like this is to divide it up. We've got the upward work, look of our work. So don't come and say, I, I don't have to work very hard because that guy doesn't deserve me to work hard. You see, we're not working for him. As a Christian, I'm working for the Lord. 
Everything that I do, if, if, we're, a, if we're a lazy somehow, some lazy some kind of employee, and we try to slough it off or we try to excuse ourselves because look at the management style of these people or look at the way these people are treating their employees. Listen, if it comes to a place, or if it comes to a point rather, that you have to quit, quit. But while you're there, serve past that employer, wicked of a cuss as he is, and serve as unto the Lord. Amen. That's the way us Christians are supposed to do. And so we, we have enough excuses that people give. There's, a, oh, there's old songs that are put out about it that tell us what we're, what we're supposed to do with this job and do this and this. My friend, that's the world's philosophy. Again, if it comes to a place where you've got to quit, quit. But do it honorably. And work past those people, the upward work, or upward look, rather, of our work. But I want you to look at the second point, and that's the correct mode of our working. We've looked at it somewhat, that we fear God. We work past, look past our employer and look to God. But here's how we're supposed to, the mode of our working sincerely in verse number 22. Not with eye service, meaning, oh, the boss is coming. I better get it together and work quick. Not with eye service, the Bible says, as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart. That word singleness just means sincerely. Just work sincerely. Eight for eight. You just work for what they pay you for and a little bit more. Don't try to slough off. That's what it's just, it, it's so practical in the Word of God. All, sometimes we think the Bible is so lofty and so high, and it is, of course. It's the Word of God, and we'll never figure it all out. But, they, but it also is a very, very practical book. It tells us to work hard for what God has given us the job. And so we see that we're supposed to work with that sincerity. I tell parents of kids today, and sometimes they'll bemoan the fact of what the, the, the society in which we live in. I said, there's never been a greater time to be a young person. If a young person would go and get there a little bit early, show up one time, a little bit early at work, and he would work or she would work the whole time that they're there and not loaf, then they can be a bright and shining star at whatever in, in entity or whatever uh, industry they go into. Because there's so many people who don't want to work at all. So you don't have to be ex excelling at that. You just have to go, show up, be a reliable employee. Or, as the Bible says, have that singleness of heart. Fearing God. So we see that. Not only that, but in verse number 23, it says we're supposed to, our correct mode is this heartily. And that brings in not just showing up, but it brings in that wholehearted aspect that working hard and so there's something that's missing in all of our houses and all of our homes as we're growing up and that is or today I should say and that is to teach people to work somehow we think well those people work hard because they're manual labor it doesn't matter whether it's a manual labor job whether it's a a, a, a a technical job, a, a mind job, whether it's uh, sitting at a desk, we still need to give up, be a hard-working person. We need to have that heartily, wholehearted working. Why? Because we're fearing God. Amen. Truly, at the end of the day, like we do everything else, Lord, did I please you? Not did anybody write me up because of my lack of, dis my lack of uh, enthusiasm. That should be so low on the list of our Christian work or our Christian ethics as we work that you don't even notice it. Well, did I get caught? Did they see me? Because remember, we are working as unto the Lord. You may not be the best. You may not be the smartest. You may not be the most able. You may not be the most capable. All those things, those were God's things that He gifted to you. Your intelligence, your ability, your talents, all those, that was God's business. He gave out what He wanted you to have. But your dedication, your hard work, those are the things that God tells you to do that as well, but you have control over that. So do it heartily, as unto the Lord, but also we do it fearing God, realizing that our head is in heaven, our big boss. And I say that reverently. So we see the correct mode of our work. It's that heartily thing. And if God is knocking on your door, you say, well, I'm just doing enough to get by. Shame on us. 
And then number three, let's look at this, the right attitude of those that are in charge. Because many people in this room, you're, you're the one that you have a, um, a, a supervisor position. You have one that folks work under you. Maybe you're not the boss, the CEO of the whole company or whatnot, but you're a manager. Well, the right attitude of those in charge. The Bible says that we're supposed to be just and equal. So we see in verse number one of chapter four, we see that we're supposed to give unto your servants that which is just and equal or right and fair. There's no place for you to have preferential treatment. Now, obviously, if you're supervising people and some are going to raise the top and some's more dependable and some's a harder worker, well, they need to come hear the lesson about they're all supposed to be a hard worker, but they probably won't. And they, even if they heard it, they might not oh, uh, heed to it. And so you as an employer, you're supposed to say, well, you are more dependable than that one. I'm going to raise you up. So just and equal doesn't mean that you give everybody the exact same thing, but it does mean you give everybody the exact same chance. And that is one thing as a side note in our nation. We are trying to make everything equal for everybody, but our nation's never supposed to make everybody have the exact same thing. It's just supposed to be, or it was built on this idea that everybody had the equal opportunity. So that's a little side note. So the right attitude, though, is to have that just and equal be right and fair. What really is upsetting is sometimes when people, they critique and they criticize and they put down and they badmouth the boss. And then when they get to be one, if they get to be one, then they don't treat the people underneath them fair, equal. You would think that that person who was at the hands of an unjust boss would be fair when he got up there, but that doesn't often happen. And so whichever role you play, or you, many of us, many of you will play both roles in your lifetime, remember that we've got to be just and fair to those that work for you. And just in case you say, well, there's no incentive for me to be just and fair. I just have to be harsh and conniving to get the job done. And I do understand that I've been in the ministry for so long that I don't know what some of you go through. But I'm begging you and pulling you back to this scriptural truth that even if your boss above you is almost dictating to you to be unfair to the people underneath you, number one, you may want to find a different boss, but, but while you're there, please heed what's said in verse number one and remember that knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. Right. How will you pray tonight when you say, Lord, please, Forgive me for where I failed you. Lord, I've messed up again. How do we have the audacity to pray for that when we know that we mistreated the people who were under our care that day? Every one of us shall give an account, the Bible says in Romans chapter 14, verse 12, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. And that's every employer, that's every employee. Never think that, well, Nobody filed a grievance against me. Nobody uh, called in HR on me. Again, just like so many other areas in our lives, just because we didn't get caught doesn't mean we got away with it. So as a Christian, we'll all stand before that judgment seat of Christ. And at that day, we would to God that we would have treated everybody in the way that the Scripture teach, tells us to, just and equal. My friend, you may say, I'm not in a great environment right now. I would be the one person in my team that operates in the way that you just laid out, well, the way that the Scripture laid out. Well, what I would tell you to do is you strive to be that one square peg in a round hole if it makes it so hard on you that you eventually, if God leads you, you have to eventually leave and go somewhere else, then let the Lord make that His will clear to you. But as long as you're there, remember that as Christians, this is our guidebook. And I'm afraid that us Christians have taken too many of our marching orders from the world because we've all been to seminars, we've all been to leadership emphasis, <clears throat> and we've all been taught how to do things. But friends, before we're an executive, before we're a manager, before we're a team lead, 
before we're a supervisor, before we're a company owner, before we're any of these things, or employee, before we're those things, we're Christian. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily unto the Lord. The Bible says it again, as I mentioned, I think already, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, whether you be that employer, whether you be that employee, whether you be that supervisor in the mid-level, whether, wherever you are, whatsoever you do. So the Scripture tells us how we are supposed to get that done. Sunday school, which I love, started not in this country, but in England, as so many things did. And Sunday school was not necessarily, at first, it was not necessarily something to get the gospel truths across to them that was normal for them to get the gospel truth because the people that were starting these Sunday schools were Christians, and so they're going to bring them in. But the reason they were started was because primarily because of a bunch of what they would call urchins, unwanted children that were all around London and the, and the likes. And these forgotten people of society were the reason that the pioneers of Sunday school started bringing those children in because nobody else wanted them. They were teaching them lots of things. Of course, the most important being the gospel. But as they were teaching them these things, there was a reason because they were, they were just the stain on society, so people thought. But one element of that was these little folks, children, were used to do some of the dirtiest and hardest jobs around there. And one of them were, was being chimney sweeps. You've all seen different shows that would depict that, that old, old Disney movie and the, of, of the chimney sweeps and things. Well, they would uh, use that, so history would tell us in England, they would use them because they were small in stature, these young people, very, very young, and they would put them up those chimneys to sweep that old soot and that, um, that that's all, the, all the soot and, and, the, and the trash out of those. Well, many of those places, they did not even want to let those chimneys cool because that would mean a, a stop in business, especially if it was a, a, a shop. And so they would send them up in those places way before they should have to their own detriment and, and sometimes to their death. And so history would tell us that the old slogan that says, I'm going to light a fire under you, would have come from them because they would literally light a fire under them because they would, they would cry to come back and they would light a fire so they would go up further and, and poke some torches up that way to get them to finish up the job. My friend, do you understand that the people that were involved in horrible things like that and, and things in our nation that we've also been, uh, been involved in that we should never be proud of, if we would just t- take a biblical look at whatever role we play, then it would change everything about how we play it. Amen. Not because somebody made us, not because a government agency came down with another regulation, not because we said that that is, that is inhumane and we're going we're gonna to send somebody out for OSHA and that, that won't pass. Way before that, in those situations and lots of others, we would say, I couldn't put a worker in that condition. Why? Because I'm supposed to treat him just and equal. And my friend, whichever role you play in this world in your company. Maybe you're retired, but the same sentiments hold true in whatever realm you're operating in. May we have these remembrances that I'm serving the Lord. If I'm here, 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 wherever. If I was working at a company, I'd want to work at a company where the janitor was just as important as the CEO. I'd want to work at a company where everybody was valued. I wouldn't need to work at a company where everybody made the same amount of pay because that probably that CEO is probably putting in three times as many hours as maybe that. I, I understand that. But I would want everybody to be valued. And may we operate ourselves. You say, I can't control my culture of my, my company. That's true. But you can control what you do through the help of the Lord. Father, bless us now as our prayer. Thank you for letting us be in this practical Scripture portion. And I pray, dear Lord, that you would have shown some people tonight something different. That, dear Lord, we don't don't just try to get all we can get out of an employee that comes our way. 
We don't just try to bust down on somebody just because we've got the superior title. Lord, that we remember we've got a God in heaven. That we treat people just and equal because we, we are commanded to by you. Bless us, I pray, dear Lord. And we'll thank you for it all in Jesus' name. If you're able to, as they begin to play, would you step, step forward if you like, come forward. I invite you tonight, maybe you're somebody that you'd say, wow, I've been doing it all wrong. I've been doing what I'm su supposed to, doing enough to get by. Or maybe I've even been lording over some people and I should not. That's right, we should not. Whatever the Lord has led you, and maybe you want to come and pray about something totally unrelated to what I spoke on tonight, but God's dealt with your heart. Would you step out and come? I'd love to meet you down at the front. As they continue to play, here's my last appeal. If you're here tonight, not sure that you're saved. I did not preach on that, but there's a reason why I wanted everybody to understand what a worker or employee or employer does, and that is because we're saved individuals, most of the people in this room. But maybe you're here tonight and you're not saved. You say, Pastor sounds to me like you're talking about a gospel you're sound about, talking about something that changes your whole life that's exactly right if you're here and you're not sure that you're saved would you step out and come let me take a bible and show you how to be sure Jesus is your savior heaven's your home thank you so much you may look this way and here in just a moment, you may have to slip out, and I understand that, but I want to stop a little bit early because we're going to stop the live stream and then show this video. I don't think there's anything on it that's that 